Hi everyone, I'm Dave Aronchik, and uh, here with Chanwit, I'm uh, extremely proud to present the same project, a GitOps approach to reproducible machine learning, starring both Kubeflow and Flux. Um, though this is a brand new project that we are excited to um, kick off and would love to get your feedback. So one thing that you hear a lot of in the news is how great ML is and the fact that it changes the world every single day. Uh, this is a study out of Google where they have some very, very smart data center engineers trying to make their power usage efficiency as high as, or excuse me, as low as possible, um, where you get as close to one unit of energy coming in and then one unit of compute um, coming out. One to one is the best. Anything else means you're wasting electricity. Um, these data center engineers worked really hard and came up with a very efficient uh, system, but then they wired up a machine learning process to the same system and tried it out. And when they did so, they saw that the uh, power usage efficiency went down enormously and saved them hundreds of millions of dollars. Same amount of compute, less energy. And just to prove it to themselves, when they turned it back off, uh, here you can see it, it popping right back up. So it really was machine learning that made all the difference. And we talk about these stories all the time in public. And that is great. Unfortunately, ML is very hard. And I don't just mean it's hard because I'm bad at math. It's hard because most folks are in one camp. They see all this news out there and magical AI goodness is over there and in between is a lot of pain. And the pain manifests like something like this, where you see people developing solutions very, very quickly and seeing good results. But when it comes to rolling them out, it still be is a big challenge. Haven't we heard this story before? Uh, we have, and that this was a lot of what we went through when we first started with containers and Kubernetes. Uh, and the way that they were able to break through that was to develop cloud native apps. And that wasn't just about developing this rich API that allowed declarative rollout. It was also developing clean interfaces and manifests that you could use to describe your app and then push those to this clean interface uh, in order to roll it out. So what we should develop is something like Cloud Native ML, the same kind of declarative interface that describes an entire pipeline and allows you to roll it out to a variety of different endpoints. What are the elements of something like Cloud Native ML? Well, in my mind, I think it breaks down to composability, portability, and scalability. Composability looks like this. You start with uh, just a model. And this is where a lot of people start. Jupyter Notebook is one of the easiest interfaces I've ever seen in order to get going quickly. But in order to do anything at scale or across environments or even inside a single environment, you really need to think beyond just that and start to think about uh, all of these other elements of a data pipeline, data ingestion, analysis, transformation, so on and so forth, all the way through to logging and monitoring. And of course, feeding all of that information back. You also want it to be portable because it, it, you could spend a bunch of time building that initial stack and you know where that initial stack that I uh, mentioned on the previous slide is only a small component of your overall stack. And then once you finally have this thing up and running and well-tuned and your laptop is working great, you then have to go and replicate the thing on a training environment, uh, which might scale out in very different ways, or on a cloud environment, again, uh, with many different requirements. Uh, if you don't have a way to reproduce that thing easily and migrate from place to place, uh, you're going to be in trouble. And finally, we get to scalability. So when you hear the word scalability, a lot of times people just think more, more infrastructure, more accelerators, more uh, disks, CPUs, and so on. Uh, but it really goes beyond that. It also goes to more programs. Uh, folks want to run thousands of programs simultaneously, compare against thousands of historical runs, all that kind of good stuff. And of course, you can see the graph over here on the right. The NeurIPS number of papers submitted is scaling enormously. Millions of papers are being published, and it's up to the data scientists to just try and keep up. But it's also scaling collaboration and people. How do you scale skill sets where you have SWEs and SREs and data scientists all working together, each of whom have particular ex sets of expertise, sc scaling your teams, adding more people and allowing you to collaborate, and then of course scaling across organizations. Uh, could be you know across a, a, under a single umbrella. If you're a very big company like me, uh, you want people from Xbox being able to share with Office, being able to share with Windows, or it could be sharing across organizations. So 
academic institution number one, wants to share with academic institution number two, that's a way to scale as well. So at the end of the day, more is correct, but really people just want to do more programs and do them faster. So that's composability, scalability, and uh, portability. And those are the essence of what I think Cloud Native ML is. So you know what's really good at composability, portability, and scalability? Containers and Kubernetes, except if you want to do that today, you first have to become an expert in a whole bunch of things. Um, containers, GPLs, service endpoints, scaling, all that kind of good stuff, uh, which is a real problem, as you might imagine, and certainly not something we want our data scientists and other highly skilled individuals having developed general tools around. So the idea would be, how do we build something that gives everyone cloud-native ML? And that's the same project which stands for Self-Assembling Machine Learning Environments. The L is silent. With same, what you do is you start with something base. In this case, we're going to start with a Kubernetes. And from there, you develop a declarative layout of a uh, what that pipeline and experiment might look like. And you're able to stamp that out anywhere you have that Kubernetes API. Now, I said start with Kubernetes. Um, we're doing a lot of looking at working with other hosted platforms as well. Uh, and there, you know, the news is very good. There's most of the stuff that you see on a lot of these different platforms is quite boilerplate. But just so that we can get started and prove out a lot of these examples, we're starting with some, you know, a narrow scope. We would love to work with other partners uh, to get things rolled out. So, how might it work? Now, this is a lot of architecture. We will get to a demo shortly that shows this thing up and running and live. Um, but I just want to lay it out for everyone to show exactly how it might work as we get closer. You have your data scientist here. She starts on a laptop. And she says, um, you know, I need a recommender. Uh, there are lots of recommenders out there in the world. These are the tools that you see when you log into your video hosting service of choice. And it shows you one image uh, and a set of other movies based on that particular image that, that they recommend that you watch. And she says, you know, I'd like to see if I can beat the recommender that's out there right now. So I'm going to go out and find one and then try and reproduce it. In this case, we have uh, one that, that NVIDIA has published, a very popular one, and she wants to try that one out. And from that point, she's going to begin to go and engage with that Kubernetes cluster. So here, you have the Kubernetes cluster that was set up for her by her IT or via Docker locally, again, that very local uh, thing. And she says, same init. And from this point, it goes forward, and it's going to initialize that environment with everything necessary in order to run a same. So this might include uh, a pipeline system, a Kubeflow dashboard, Kubeflow metadata store, so on and so forth. Again, you can use ones that are outside of the core. Uh, we just set one up for you for free. So then she goes into the repository herself, and she says, I want to run it. Now, inside that is going to be a same file. This assumes that NVIDIA has gone and created that thing. Uh, but it's very simple to create. And if you don't have one, you can create it on your own. There's nothing terribly complicated. But by doing this, you now have a code style uh, declarative statement for exactly how this entire pipeline should run. The first thing that does is it goes out and provisions the necessary hardware using the CLI uh, and the, the uh, cluster setup that, that is built into Kubernetes. It, here, she wants GPU nodes. She wants premium disk. These are things that can be declared. Next, she installs the necessary services for this pipeline run. Uh, this pipeline requires a feature store that she names 2.4. It requires TensorFlow 1.8, and it requires CatTip 1.2. She's able to declare that, and the system rolls it out on her behalf. After that, it's going to download data from an external source to local premium disk. Again, this is optional. These are things you can do as part of your pipeline. But it also uh, sets up a very clear path for how she might engage uh, with that data. Uh, we see oftentimes people doing this, dropping things in buckets, and we wanted to take care of that for her. After that, it's going to deploy the pipeline to that cluster. So it's actually going and creating that pipeline. Here, like, as I mentioned, there's a feature store step, a, a training step, and a hyperparameter sweep step, each of which are designed to use those in-cluster services. And then finally, it's going to insert metadata into the store. Now, NVIDIA had, has decided to publish a subset of its overall metadata. She pushes that uh, when she clones it, it pulls that down and pushes it into her metadata store. 
and again, you you might ask, well, why is this necessary? You know, you have all the the uh, examples and store there locally. It's true you do, but many people need to compare many models over time. And by having this in a common metadata store, you're going to be able to compare new runs against those existing ones. So that's it. It's now set up and run. And as I said, you can see it's same program run. So it's now going to go forward and execute it. Here it's executing experiment number eight because it detects that it is number eight as part of the overall. Again, making comparison to previous runs much easier. It pushes the artifact down to her premium disk and pushes the additional metadata into her metadata store. And then she decides that she wants to change a parameter, uh, changing the number of epochs to 2,000 instead of a batch parameter of 1,000, which it does, and it ex runs experiment number nine and, and runs that as well. So now she's able to compare against these various things uh, and see exactly how it's going to run moving forward. And ideally, it's doing this all from code and GitOps. And this is where things like Flux that have a great awareness of both ends of the spectrum, both the starting point over at code, uh, all the way through uh, to the way that things need to roll out uh, in production. And that's what we're going to demo now. Uh, let me hand it over to Chanwit, who's going to demonstrate how to roll out using same and wire that up using Flux in order to automate your MLOps pipeline. Hello. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to use BAM and Flux to implement a machine learning operation pipeline, of course, using GitOps. Okay, uh, now we have uh, the diagram here. And with this diagram, uh, we have three, we're going to have uh, three different environments. The first one is a local K uh, Kubernetes cluster, and the second one is Azure AKS cluster. And the third one is going to be our prod, uh, production Kubernetes cluster, which runs only the uh, inference program. In the diagram, you're going to see it as uh, prod UI. OK, let's start with the uh, local cluster. What we're going to do uh, in the local cluster is that we, we're going to clone the same program from a Git repo. After we cloning it down to our laptop, we going to start um, develop develop our program. And in this example, the program we're going to use here as a case study is the uh, TensorFlow uh, retrain flower classification. It's a deep learning uh, model training. Okay. Now we have uh, our cloned repository here, and this is uh, the repository on GitOps. Then we also have a local cluster here. You can use any kind of uh, small cluster implementation like Kind or K3S or any. Um, then we run the uh, same init command, and uh, this what same init command does is that it's going to install the Kube flow pipeline components into our cluster. After the installation succeed, we going to, we are ready now to um, uh, run our same program. And the same program is inside the uh, train uh, directory of this repo. Okay, we're going to call this submission the local run and you uh, you see here the uh, revision number. Uh, this is a parameter we we go, we're going to send um, it to the pipeline upon running. Okay, uh, we're going to use um, the uh, mobile net model as as our base model for retraining. So we retrain the uh, mobile net model uh, using the uh, flower classification data set. And now what we're going to do uh, is to or call the uh, same program run. When you call the same program run uh, in the directory containing uh, same YAML file, it's going to submit your program into the uh, Kubeflow pipeline cluster, which is already running locally on our, uh, on our laptop. OK. Now you see it in the UI that the pipeline running through, and we got the uh, training step, which is the uh, EBC preparation, the pre-processing step, the return step, and finally we select the best model. And the model 
here we only have one model so yeah it's the best one we have uh you you're gonna see that the accuracy is not that high because it's a model a mobile net uh model and and um we run we ran it just only one epoch so we got the uh not very not that high uh accuracy now after the uh, after the um model has been trained it's gonna store inside our um s3 compatible server which is minio at the moment okay that's the first part we run uh we 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 install cool for pipeline components into our local cluster using same it then we ran the uh, same program run command to submit our program to retrain our classification model next we're going to do this in a more scalable way on actual cluster and in in the term that um we're going to do this uh, in the more scalable way it's, it's mean that um we're gonna use GitOps component, um, which is which is Flux uh, components. We we are gonna use same and Flux together. Uh, to and we're gonna use the same controller for Flux v2 inside actual cluster to train our program automatically every time we do git push. So this is the push to train technique, and um, it's mean that. We don't need to uh, prepare any kind of dev environment at all because everything like uh, same controller, same program, also the Kufo pipeline components, all of them will be running on the Azure cluster. And what we're going to do is just change our program, and our same book, change our same program, commit and put. Then the uh, Flux V2 same controller will pick up a change and retrain our program automatically. Now we already have actual cluster, which is a large one, uh, quite larger than our, our uh, laptop setup. And we now install, uh, um, we now, we're now going to install the uh, Coolflow components using the uh, Flux bootstrap step, not the not the same init command anymore. The, the whole cluster has been set up using Flux command. And now we're making change to our program, change the name of the program into Azure Run. And we're going to start with uh, training the mobile net again. We retrain the mobile net again and see the result. And after that, uh, we're gonna do the uh, uh, more complex problem by retraining three models at a time. Now going first with the uh, single um, model, and here you see that that um, here you see that uh, we change the uh, number of our models from one to three, which is the mo mobile, uh, mobile net inception v3 and efficient net v3. Now we met chain and commit and put. Okay, let's see what's going on on the big cluster. We got the uh, more beautiful um, pipeline graph and it's compiled and then at the final step of the of the work uh, of the pipeline, you see that it's gonna select the best model out of these three. And what is what it is is that it save the best one into the uh, mini cluster inside our Azure Kubernetes cluster. Okay, now I'm going to explore a bit. Um, yeah, you see the ML pipeline park, uh, ML pipeline bucket and our models here inside the uh, cluster, the, inside the Azure cluster. Um, we uh, use the revision uh, number from our Git repo as a metadata of uh, the, the trained model. So you see inside the Minio server that we store the revision number of each trained model. Okay, here. Yeah the metadata the revision number that we took from git and uh, this is the uh, the metadata that's saved by the uh, select best model step okay so what's it that um 
we're going to use that revision to trace our model so we know that where this came from which revision is built from uh and this revision this model revision number is going to display inside our front end program too now let's predict some flowers and here it's going to be ending we put the best model inside the model storage here you see in diagram and not only the model we also generate a deployment yami file and put it inside the model storage too then we use flag to sync from the bucket i show you the bucket um, definition okay we point um, this bucket to flux and we have a customization object of flux to do the auto deployment every time the bucket change so that's why we got uh we're going to get the uh ui on the staging cluster every time now let's move to the production cluster we already have a staging program running using the model in uh inside model storage of the actual cluster now what we're going to do next is uh to show the ability to tag the repository then we put this we, we put that tag and the promotion workflow inside github going to create it's going to generate a pull request for us to do the production promotion so the idea is that we tag and put to promote the staging version of the model to the production cluster okay here our prod cluster then we um initialize everything using flux bootstrap we install kufo pipeline we install ui program we install other setting uh now uh in our production cluster we have another revision of the model running there with tag number 026 v026 that's a version that there's a lot text number on the production now we have let's see um now we have a uh, azure cluster on the azure cluster we have another version of the module just trained in store there and we like to promote this revision of the module to the production now we tagged it as the version 030 and push the tag okay let's see it's going to create a new pull request for us using a github action and then you're going to see a pull request okay it's 030 then we're going to merge this using um github just like what we do normally and it's going to come in to the main branch and flux on the prod cluster watching the change and pull the chains and now you see that the prod cluster running the last uh the the version uh the mode of revision that we we wanted we tag it as the version 030 and then now we can do some classification with the new model and that's all for the uh, machine learning operation pipeline using same and flux together so with that thank you so much uh, excellent demo of showing how this is all the code is obviously open source. You can go out and check it out right now uh, and install it. Uh, you can, in fact, use Same. We're making changes to it you know, virtually daily right now. Uh, but it is very, very not for production use. I can't stress that enough. It's a great thing to explore and give us feedback to. Um, and, and we would love that. And if you want to have some uh, private conversations around this as well, uh, we would love to hear from you as well. The same CLI experience, as you may have seen, um, uh, is designed to be really straightforward. One line to install it, one line to run an experiment, including pointing it at an external repo. We'll clone that and do other things for you. One line to run it with a different set of parameters, which is something that folks need to do a lot, particularly if they're doing a big grid search across a number of different hyperparameters. And then one line to export. And of course, I cannot stress enough, this is very, very early stuff. We haven't implemented all of these verbs and features, but so far as we test this with customers, they really do appreciate it and think that this is the right way to go. And you heard me talk about a same manifest quite often. Uh, you may think that it's quite complicated. It's really not. It's designed to be very straightforward. Here you can see an entire manifest, including versions, 
uh, uh, disk mounts that you might need, data sets you want to download, pipelines that you'll want to use, and of course this last section, which is probably the most important section, where you talk about exactly the run parameters that you might have. And the reason this is so important is because now I declare this run and I'm able to push that into my Git and trigger everything from that single same file, which now becomes a record for exactly how to reproduce this run. At the ideal, we're really trying to, met, to get at the center of this Venn diagram. We want something to be completely open source governed, no shadows of being a commercial entity. This is truly in open source, contributed to by lots of external people. We want it to be a declarative deployment. As long as you have a Kubernetes or Kubernetes-like API, you push this there and it will just execute. And based on a universal platform. So uh, you know, if, if it requires you to install something that, that really isn't out there broadly, that's gonna be a problem. That's why we chose Kubernetes as a starting point because that, that is a, uh, you know, so universal, you can get it on virtually any credit, uh, cloud with a credit card swipe. Now that said, we do we would uh, do and would love to support lots of other platforms, and we are looking at that right now. Um, uh, one of the things that is so important for us is, you know, we in in the core team don't have expertise in these other platforms. And if you're a data pipeline or you're a machine learning um, a system or something like that, and want to engage, we would love to hear from you. So what can you do? Uh, we are just getting started. The best thing you can do is go join our, our mailing list, go join our Slack, come ask questions. You can try out the binary. We plan on open sourcing shortly. Um, uh, we haven't gotten through all the details yet, but this will appear in open source, uh, open source license and all that good stuff. Um, and you can come join our repo. Um, uh, you know, we haven't moved everything out just yet, um, but you're more than welcome to come in, file issues and things like that, and we would love to hear from you. And if it's something else, please call me. Um, you can see my contact information there. Uh, we would love to hear from you. And with that, thank you very much. Hey everyone. Um, so I'm Dave Ronchek and here to answer any of your questions. Um, uh, you know, we got a question already about uh, getting access to the code. So the binary is out there. You can just go to sameproject.org and download the binary and try that out. Uh, unfortunately, the code isn't out there, but we do have a lot of samples. We have some samples for MNIST and and uh, uh, reinforcement learning and, and cross-selling and all these various things. You can check out the uh, repo and see all that code and download it and reuse it. Um, it you know, all works uh, right now with Kubeflow right out of the box, so you don't even have to use same in order to do that, um, but you certainly can do it with same. Um, and we're exploring, um, you know, we'll, we'll get the rest of the code out uh, pretty shortly. Um, uh, let's see here, sorry. Uh, in addition to that, you know, I do get a lot of questions like, okay, you said Kubeflow a lot. Um, you know, is this a Kubeflow only thing? Absolutely not. Um, our, our goal is to really start with not, you know, all the way to the left-hand side, the way that people design and build software today uh, in machine learning and data science and data engineering using notebooks and help that move all the way through to your deployment platform, whatever it might be, Kubernetes, Kubeflow, Airflow, any of the hosted providers, uh, Azure Machine Learning, um, uh, SageMaker, and Google Cloud uh, Machine Learning, and so on, uh, all these various pipeline systems. So we, we have a really big vision here. The goal is, though, to make things far more portable, make it much easier to capture your environment, capture your intent at point of authorship, and then allow it to flow through very quickly and use platforms like Flux um, uh, you know, first class GitOps and, and CICD platforms that move all the way through and make it very easy to, to roll out these declarative deployments. Um, any other questions we have out there? Um, uh, one of the things that we are looking at right now is around different model types and different requirements. Um, you know, we think that, that you know, Deep learning can often get a lot of the attention. Uh, this is certainly not just a deep learning only thing. Uh, one of the things we do see a lot of is people, you know, getting something running on their local machine and having a good time with it. But um, then when it comes to moving it to production, it requires this massive gap. And if we can reduce that by, by making it easier to develop in a production ready way locally, uh, using something like Do the Kubernetes and Docker or Kind or something like that, and then when it comes time to run it in production, the difference is much smaller 
So, um, you know, we could be really, you know, um, optimistic about uh, uh, the amount of changes that might be required. Um, other than that, any questions? Should I start a poll? No. Um, if you have any questions, you can see the Slack. You can see our mailing list. You can contact me on Twitter or wherever you like. Uh, with that, uh, thank you very much.